All right, looks like we're good. We are doing our daily SAT podcast, one of the best kept secrets in the high school and college application world. And we're going to be talking today about how to approach the SAT reading section. I am Alex Torres, and I have my buddy, Pasquale Patrick Spano. We're both internationally recognized SAT tutors. And are you here? Are you hearing that feedback right now? Yes. I okay, can hear let me, yeah, oh, yeah okay. I know what that is. Let me stop. No, I, it sounds good from my end. Really? Yeah. I thought you were asking if I can hear your feed. I had a web window open and I was hearing my own okay. voice. Like that's something in the world can, of can... online tutoring. There is nothing worse than hearing your own voice. Do you agree? Like when yes, you get it feedback happens sometimes. you hear yourself, it's like, oh, it's I hate great my own voice. I love everyone else's voice. I hate my own voice. <laughs> So, so Patrick, how are you today? Doing well. We're, we're here. We're ready. Friday, the end of the week, we're going to do some reading. I'm sure it's what everyone wants to do on a Friday afternoon or it's noon time now, people that are on, on the East Coast. But yeah, I feel good. I feel ready. And uh, I'm excited to just uh, keep on pumping out uh, some good information to whoever's watching and uh, when the videos will be archived after just to grow our content and just help as many students as possible with these small little daily tips. Yeah, and there's nothing uncool about getting a high SAT score. In fact, I was dealing with a, a really advanced middle school student yesterday. Um, but, you know, she's just from that other generation. So she's complaining to her mom that, you know, I can't really get into like these reading comprehension tests because they're boring. And I, I could see that, especially on the SAT. I think they really do pick content that is going to be out of touch with what kids are interested in these days. Like, you're getting stuff from the 1700s, things that are extremely scientific, you know, but what I told her is, you know, we need to view this more as a game and as a puzzle and as like an a, attack that we're going to approach this test a certain way, you know, and like sort of, yeah, like this challenge, which fit that person's personality and fits most of our personality, because I mean, there's just nothing <laughs> inherently fun about this, about this style of reading. And so we'd rather um sort of approach it in a way that's gonna um you know just a little mind, better get you a little yeah yeah more kind just, of motivated that's a very good point and just to add also yeah it's not uncool to be smart or to get good grades or to do well on on this test but i think also to prepare yourself to put in the man hours to you know get ready for the reading section study the sat math and all of that sometimes if you just look at it in terms of the content it's a little dry it's a little boring, but I just like tell students, just picture yourself after scoring, insert dream score, 1600, 1500, 1450. Just picture yourself in that moment, checking the college board site, seeing that, how you'd feel in that moment, how you would feel, how your parents would feel, what you would tell your friends. I think if you could just kind of own in on that feeling. And again, this is maybe not the best way to approach most things uh, as school or sports, but really with this test, it's a one-time thing and it might not be the most enjoyable thing. So if you can really just picture yourself and feel yourself with the outcome that you'd really like, that can uh, maybe serve to motivate you and to push through sometimes when it's a little uh, tedious to study. So just picture the end result and what you'd feel like with a 1600 and that might help push you over the edge to uh, keep studying and put in the extra hours to make sure you're ready. Yeah. And I talked to a lot of my students about, you know, yeah, we want to boost our score. Yeah, in the state of Florida, we want to get the Bright Future Scholarship, which is this full scholarship if you have, you know, in the range of 1300 or above on the SAT, which is wonderful. Um, but let's talk about, you know, when you're 25, 28 years old and you're at a cocktail party and suddenly over martinis, everyone wants to say, hey, what did you get on the SAT? What did you got on the SAT? And don't you want to just be like, ha, 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 I got 1550. <laughs> next drink it'll give you some good street cred yeah that's another good way of looking at it <laughs> i mean because you know we are in the business of getting people into college but we'll also be the first ones to tell you that you know in a lot of ways college is a sham i mean you know sixty thousand dollars a year for tuition and um you're not really gaining that many skills that are really going to make you employable when it's all Correct. said and done you know i mean if they're right. if it's my kids i I would um, just really want to, you know, at a good school, at a top school or a moderate school or a community college, just make sure that they get the best college GPA they can get into a good grad school, you know? So 
you know, why not? I mean, if, if Yale University is just inviting you and, and uh, pre-freshman orientation starts next week, why wouldn't I want to go? It's, I'm not saying don't go to the best college you can, uh, but it's not the most important thing, you know, and that should take the edge off. You know, you want to do the best you can. You want to see this as a challenge, as fun. You know, you want to get into it, but not that sort of anxiety, that pressure of, oh, my God, if I don't do this, you know, that kind of thing that we see so often as tutors, right? Very good point. Yeah. And with this test also, as we'll be showing with these videos, there's a lot of free content out there or content and um, help that is maybe on the cheaper side. Test prep tends to be very costly. So there's a lot of free resources out there that you can use in order to get a great score and maybe get grants um, so that you can go to one of these top schools and not even have to pay that much. So it's in your best interest to just put your best foot forward while you're at this, you know, uh, 14, 15 years old till 17, 18 years old to really just do your best. And uh, that's why we want to just help students. Um, again, if college is what you're thinking of, or if you get a good enough score, top score, to be able to get a grant and those kinds of things for college, it helps. But if not, it's not the end of the world. Um, you may as well do your best while you're trying to pursue it, which is why we're here to help. Yep, absolutely. So with that in mind, we're going to approach the SAT reading section. Definitely hands down the most intimidating thing about the SAT. But, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. And, you know, in our years as tutors, I know personally our approaches evolve. So, you know, the SAT was just introduced to us. The redesigned SAT was introduced in 2015. And we try this and try that. And maybe a couple of months with this new idea with students. And so, you know, our, our students over the years have, in essence, kind of been our lab rats. And we've uh, evolved our approaches. And so what we're giving you is the best of the best of you know, how we feel about the SAT and it has worked. I can't, you know, begin to tell you how many students' lives have been changed by being able to now, you know, get certain achievements and, um, and just psychologically just know that, you know, wow, I can do this and your self-esteem goes up and your motivation goes up. And even if college is a sham, you know, you know, you can do it and so on. So let's go ahead and jump into the reading section here. So how to approach the SAT reading section. So Let's first talk about how most people would logically approach the section, like how you would do it if you haven't had a tutor sort of give you their best advice, what, you know, what the sort of common sense approach would be, would be to read really in depth from the beginning. You know, you feel like, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to remember all this stuff later. And that's a stressful feeling. Uh, so there's this feeling of trying to record the information in your mind so you'll be able to remember it, almost like your brain is like a flash drive or something. And uh, it's just inherently destined to fail because our brains can only in short term memory really remember like five things. So if you try to just upload a passage into your brain after the first five things, it, it, it just the house of cards comes crashing down. And I ask students every day, you know, have you ever had that feeling that you read something you have just no idea what you read? And people are like, yes, yes, I've had that feeling, you know, and my answer is it's because you're trying too hard. You know, let's let's be realistic about this, um, you know. Let's do what kind of we can do right now. And we have this approach that kind of factors that in. So we'll get into it. But tutors, other tutors, you know, I have lots of clients who've tutored with someone else and now they're tutoring with me. So I'll hear what the other tutor has told that student. And the suggestion is to read the questions before starting. Um, prepare your approach before you read. So, okay, I know they're going to ask me about this. They're going to ask me about that. You sort of like configure your brain before you read it. And that does sound logical. And I'd hate to sort of put down tutors who sort of make those recommendations. But once again, complicated. You know, do we need more complication in our lives? I know I don't. My life is complicated enough. What about you, Patrick? Yeah, I would say probably somewhat. Not too complicated, though. There you Just go. Enough. You're my hero. So... <laughs> These approaches are too difficult in my approach, in my view, too complicated. So what's our approach going to be? Our approach is the idea of going from easy to difficult. Your initial read of the passage should take around 60 seconds. Now that should, if you're really paying attention right now, that should bother you because especially someone who's seen copies of the SAT and know that the passages were written, the passages were written by Abraham Lincoln and Harry David Thoreau and the guys who discovered DNA. Um, it's hard to read that in 60 seconds. So trust me, we'll take care of that. That'll be okay. You will be able to read it in 60 seconds. But what we want to do is we want to get that just that primary purpose. Like I said, if it's five or more things you have to remember on the sixth thing, you'll be forgetting. So if I tell you just read this passage and tell me what's the main thrust, what's the main reason why the author wrote this? The author is trying to prove that researchers should archive their null results, which comes from one of the official eight 
a college board practice test, right? So if you come out of that passage knowing that, and on that particular passage, that's the number one thing most students come out not realizing. If you don't know, if you read that passage, you don't know what a null result is, nothing else is going to work for you because the whole passage just throws around the phrase null results as if you're supposed to know it. Uh, Airbnb it. Um, Patrick reminded me that it's a little phrase that I use from time to time, but if you rent an Airbnb, which is like this, you know, if you haven't heard of Airbnb, this uh, company that allows you to rent other people's houses when you're on vacation, um, you know, you don't go straight to the kitchen and count how many forks are in the kitchen drawer. You go to the bedroom, you go to the pool, you go to the, the jacuzzi, you go and you see where everything is because you plan on going back and truly enjoying it later. And that's how you should approach a passage. Just get in, just kind of see what it's all about and get the heck out of there. So uh, if you worked more at this stage, it would be like preparing for a hundred possible questions because there is that much information in each of these passages, but they're only gonna ask you 10 or so questions. So you just don't wanna over-prepare. You don't wanna approach it in a way that's gonna have wasted energy for you. Um, well, how does this jive with the actual specifics of the SAT reading section? It's extremely evidence-based. Any reading comprehension test is evidence-based, but this is extremely evidence-based. So for instance, if the right answer was she was confused and surprised, uh, if that's what choice C says, and that's the right answer, confused and surprised, and you look in the passage, it'll say something like, you know, bewildered, which means confused and surprised, right? So they, they tend to line up that beautifully. And so you would never want to answer a question without physically seeing the line that answers that question. The writers of the SAT reading section are masters at writing these questions where if you kind of just answer generally based on what you understand without actually looking, they've got you because they're just masterful at writing these questions where there's a teeny tiny little detail that changes things. If you physically get your eye on the evidence that supports that answer choice at the moment that you're picking it, then you're less likely to fall into those traps. Anything to add yet, Patrick? Yeah, I like to call them the interpretation or the answers that are basically an interpretation of the text, but still outside the bounds of what is actually written. So the evidence for it may not be in the passage, but yes, there are masters that make these answers sound very plausible, very reasonable. Um, yes, they do a very good job of that, which is why many times students will say, I was stuck between these two and I really didn't know what the difference was. That's when you have to come back to the passage because yes, they are um, very skillful at after you've after you've gone through the passage, thinking that one answer again sounds very plausible and very reasonable, and without checking back to the text um, for the specific line or the specific lines that will support which answer needs to be correct. Yes, you will. Uh, it's a very common trap for students to fall into. Yeah, exactly. So, um, let's see where we're gonna go next with it. So I would, you know, uh, Patrick, you're in Belgium, right? So it's correct. It's around uh, 6 p.m. on a Friday night in Belgium. Do you have any cool uh, plans going on? <laughs> I'm here talking about the SAT. Yeah, <laughs> no, uh, not too much. I might uh, do some more work after and uh, get to bed early. Uh, I have a hockey game tomorrow night, so oh, nothing, nothing crazy <laughs> going on here. But I'm sure um, noon time in, in Florida. I'm sure there's. Uh, much more happening than over here. <laughs> well, I'm I'm an over the hill, you know, father of four, and uh, my idea of adventure is putting on my basketball shorts and going out and playing basketball with young kids and seeing uh, <laughs> how how long I can hang with them before I feel like I'm going to have a heart attack. Yeah. Um, but but anyway, what we're talking about on the reading section here, um, you know, for you high school kids. Sorry guys, I'm talking about you. You guys can be pretty lazy sometimes um, in, an, in an age where everything is just given to you and handed to you. Um, it's, it's very tempting to just wanna do things too quickly and, and move fast and not verify why you're picking your answer. So you're up against your own laziness when you do this and you're fighting against that. And that should be a rule that you challenge yourself on when you're practicing. Never ever answer a question without seeing what your uh, sort of evidence is what is corroborating that physically every single time don't rely on your memory because um, our memory can slightly change something or perceive it a little differently and we'll also today be talking about some ways to split those hairs and know exactly what they're talking about in a way that's not up for debate so 
there would be no time to do this, um, this sort of corroborating every single thing every time if you spend a long time reading in the beginning, if you spend the seven to 10 minutes that that passage really almost demands. Um, it's funny, we picked SAT test one for this uh, that we're gonna use our actual examples for. And I was looking at SAT test one and I'm like, oh, that's DNA. such a painful one, DNA. that reading section. You know, <laughs> I, I was tempted to kind of uh, just skip ahead to the easiest possible one, but you gotta, <sighs> gotta go for it. So we'll be doing that in a little bit. So. Uh, the funny thing is, in trying to save students time over the years, we've discovered an approach that actually works better. So there's this amazing sort of trifecta going on where when you're going in the most time effective manner, you're actually getting the highest uh, comprehension and retention. So we're not just doing this to save you time. We're actually uncovering this overall approach to reading that's going to help you not just on the SAT, but in life. I mean, what is college? They're going to give you all these long things to read and just say, have this read by next week, write a report on this by three weeks from now. And so if you can really just make better sense of your reading in less time with less effort, your life is going to be a lot easier, especially for someone who's going through the college process. So how do we do all this? Don't read every word. Um, it's not what you read. It's what you don't read. I tell, I tell that to students every day. Um, now, what does that mean? You want to trust in your unconscious ability to process the words that you're not enunciating in your inner monologue. Wow. You should say that again. Yeah. I think it's worth reading that again. I think that's a very, that's a very well said and important point. Trust in your unconscious ability to process the words that you're not actually enunciating in your inner monologue. So now you've been reading since whatever age you learned to read, six years old, five years old, whatever. And, you know, we read every day, all day to a degree, right? So as we're going through a little on the fast side, you got to build up trust that you know, there's almost two parts of your mind. There's the conscious and the unconscious. So as we're speeding through, the other part of our mind is actually doing the rest of it, but we're not stopping on it. The other thing is focusing your energy on verbs. Now, this is what I meant when we said uh, a way to split hairs. That's not up for debate. I was originally a math tutor. That's why I got into SAT. And a company that I was working with said, hey, we're going to train you on reading. I was like, oh, no, math is my specialty. But they're like, yeah, but if, if you don't let us train you on reading, we're going to have to fire you. I was like, all right, I'll train on reading. Sounds good. So, uh, but I was intimidated. I was already a tutor and I still was intimidated by all this stuff. But when I learned sort of the mathematical approach to this, which has a lot to do with verbs, suddenly I was like, whoa, this is actually just like math. There, there are formulas, there are formulaic approaches that you follow. And one of the things that troubled me the most was that in reading, there are multiple ways to interpret things, right? Like, I mean, I might read it and take one thing out. You might read it and take something else out. But I guarantee you this, if you focus your energy on verbs, you'll get to that one and only one thing that was being said. And you'll be reading it in the way that the college board intended for you to read it to get that right answer. So verbs are paramount. I, I could very easily have just made this a lesson only on verbs and it arguably would be just as effective. What are the important verbs? They're the linking verbs. In school, they're called linking verbs. Is, was, are, am, were, be, have, has, had. If you don't know that list of verbs, know them. These are the most common verbs and the easiest to ignore. So just trust me on the idea that verbs are important. And these are the verbs that you probably would miss if you hadn't been trained to look for them. Also, these words are not verbs. They seem like they are, but they're not. So verbs would be you know general verbs. Everyone knows what they are, but they'd be words like run, punch, and jump. Those would be verbs, but running, punching, and jumping are not verbs. And also to do words. So run, punch, and jump are verbs, but to run, to punch, and to jump are not verbs. So I might say, I like blueberries. And I might also say, I like running, or I like to run. So blueberries, which is a noun, and running or to run occupy the same part of a sentence. So they're actually functioning as nouns. So if you do actually need to be an expert on verbs, then this is the little tiny bit of info that's actually going to help you to really, um, really, really, you know, work on that ability to the, you know, to the best of your abilities. Anything to add, Patrick? No, I think it, uh, that's, that's a very good point. Um, yeah, you don't have to read every single word. So if you're asking, what should I read? Well, verbs, that's where one place to start. <laughs> yeah, and, and we'll, omit the non-verbs. 
So. And we'll, we'll be modeling this as we get into an actual passage. Um, but the verbs, I, I think of them as like neon signs. If you think of the Las Vegas strip or something, they're neon signs that tell you, look right here. So the verbs will lead you to sentences that say like researchers say this, the data shows that over time, the sample churned into something else. You know, this was the most important thing we discovered. So the verbs are telling you, look here, look here, look here. And you'll notice entire portions of a sentence, the modifier, the, you know, the dependent parts of the sentence that just don't contain any verbs. And so it's, it's almost like the author's unconscious way of telling you this is what's really important and this is what's not so important. So how does this work? Um, just as, as in terms of how to approach reading sections, um, you first come out. So you're doing a 60 second first read, you're skipping words and we'll model this in a moment, but you're coming out with a superficial understanding of the passage at first. You get a question and you re-speed read in response to each question you see. So now, of course, what's the SAT going to do to throw a wrench into this process? They're going to give you some of the toughest questions right in the beginning, some of the real main idea of the whole thing type of questions. So you got to be willing to skip those, and that'll be one of the bullet points in a second. Uh, every time you reread, you become more and more of an expert on this passage. So I'm getting just enough info to answer this. Um, but my sort of experience level, my flight miles on this passage are, are advancing as we go. This seems to utilize, in my opinion, a different part of your brain. As you're reading in response to specific questions, you're reading with a purpose, purpose-based reading, and you're processing even the things that you don't need at that moment. So very quickly, you'll get to this point where you're an expert, um, and you'll know, like if they ask you about a certain key point, you'll already know, oh yeah, that's what they talk about around line 70 or something. Because every time you were going through the passage, looking for the information for other questions, you were also processing that thing on line 70, because at the time it was unimportant, but the mental process of saying to yourself, you know, oh, I don't really need this right now. Guess what? You processed it. And it, it became part of your understanding of everything. This is totally different than what we feel most people would naturally do, which is just read. So purposeless reading is random and it generates that feeling of, I have no idea what I just read. Purpose-based reading is where it's at. And I mean, you know, the extreme uh, example of this is the ACT science section where I tell students, just don't even read anything until you're already trying to answer question one and read in response to questions because the ACT science is incredibly technical um, you know, it just, it's just in one ear out the other. But like I said earlier, key to this method will be your willingness to skip questions that you're not quite ready for yet. So, and then the also end. just want to point out to, um, to kind of stratify between the main idea questions that you could skip and then the more detail specific questions that you should start with. Usually those will be signaled by, um, specific lines. So that's also one point that sometimes we'll say you can start with the questions where a specific line is mentioned and then you know that the sporting evidence might not be exactly on that line or those lines but it'll be around those lines so it, at least it points you uh, a bit more and then once you go through those and you reread the passage you re-speed re -speed read the passage with those questions then when you get to the main idea now the question won't necessarily tell you which line or which lines you need to look at but you'll be or uh, it will be easier for you to figure out what part of the passage um, you're going to, or where you're going to find the, the supporting evidence for those main idea questions. Yeah, exactly. So we're kind of talking about easing your way into a passage. The beauty of all of this is this matches the way your mind works. I mean, if I introduce you to someone uh, who just has the absolute potential to be your best friend, they're not going to be your best friend in the first 30 seconds that you're meeting the person. But as you get to talking about different things and asking questions and bonding and what, what have you, then you become best friends. And it's a natural process that is unavoidable. So, you know, this method that we're talking about kind of incorporates, let's go ahead and read the passage in a way that is natural for ourselves anyway. And, you know, absolutely has had tremendous success. In fact, I lost an, a client in India this week. Uh, a girl was getting on the ACT, she was getting 35 in English, 36 in math, 24, 25 ish on the other two sections, right? So she comes to me for an approach on ACT reading and science. And I get to know her a little, I find out how she's reading. And I say, you know, exactly what we said in this passage, you're doing it all wrong. You're trying so hard in the beginning, it leaves you with no time and energy at the end, read it really superficially in the beginning, and then verify each answer choice. 
never saw her again. She started just getting 35s and 36s and that was it. So I was like, oh, great. You know, um, that's a success story. But, oh. What a what <laughs> an anticlimactic success story. I don't get to tutor this student anymore because she figured out the secret to it. But <laughs> no, so be it. So be it. So we are looking on College Board Test 1 to kind of model this process. And um, there is a link in the comments if you're watching us in real time. Um, and if you're not, then that gives you even more time to go on the College Board website and go ahead and try to find College Board Practice Test 1. And we're looking in Section 1, Passage 1. And I just kind of want to model this style of initial reading before we get into questions. And, and you know, um, I didn't realize this would be happening, but we're keeping our lessons short. And we may end up just doing part two of this lesson on Monday so that we're not too rushed. But I'm just going to go ahead and read out loud. I got to put my money where my mouth is because I'm telling you that you should be able to read this in 60 seconds. So you want I me mean? to time you? Should I, should I set oh, a time? Oh, man. Thanks for the, the offer, the Patrick. What a good buddy here. <laughs> All right. So before Patrick has time to start his timer, I'll go ahead and get started. So <laughs> Akira came directly breaking tradition. Uh, was that it? Had he followed for him? Had he asked his mother uh, to speak to his father to approach a go-between? Would she have been receptive? He came on winter's eve. He pounded on the door. It was raining near the veranda. Chi uh, thought he was the wind. The maid knew better. She heard the footsteps and the door, then the maid, um, then they answered the door, whatever. Um, she was reluctant to go to her guest. She was feeling cozy. She and Naomi were reading at a table. By the way, I, I broke one of my rules. You've got to always read this part. And so it's an easy rule to break. And I did it myself here. But that little sort of italicized portion will all often give you insights that you really need. But a quilt was over her. So she had some heat. Who is it at this hour? Uh, Shinoda Akira, Kobe Dental College. Naomi recognized the name. I think you should go, said Naomi. Akira was waiting in the entry. Uh, as he bowed, uh, she glanced beyond him. In the rain, she saw his reflection. Madam, said Akira, forgive my disruption, but I come with urgency. His voice was soft. He stole a deferential peek at her face. Um, his eyes shone with sincerity. Uh, she felt herself starting to like him. Come inside, get out of the night. I don't want to trouble you. Um, normally, I would approach you more properly, but I've received word of a position. I'm going to America as a dentist. Congratulations. That is an opportunity, but how am I involved? Even noting Naomi's breathless reaction to the name card, she had no idea. Akira's message, delivered like a speech, filled her with amusement. Um, that's how she viewed him as a child. It was how she viewed Naomi, even though Naomi was 18 and training in the arts to make a marriage. Um, she had no effort to find a husband. Depending on your response, I may stay in Japan. Uh, I've come to ask for Naomi's hand. Suddenly, she felt the dampness of the night. Does Naomi know your ambitions? We have an understanding. Please don't judge my candidacy by the unseemliness of this proposal. I asked directly because a go-between takes time. Um, if you give me your consent, I become her Yoshi, which on the bottom, it says a Yoshi is like a... Um, like a sponsor, will live in Fuji uh, to secure a home for my new bride. Eager to make his point, he looked her fully in the face. Uh, my humble apologies, my address is on the card. Until then, good night, he bowed and left. Mother, Chi heard Naomi's low voice and turned from the door. He has asked you, the sight of Naomi's eyes gave Chi strength. Um, where did you meet such a fellow? Imagine, he thinks he can marry the Fuji heir and take her to America all with a snap of his fingers. Chi waited for Naomi's ripe laughter. Naomi was silent. She stood a half minute looking straight into Chi's eyes. Finally, she spoke. I met him at my literary meeting. Naomi turned to go back into the house, then stopped. Mother, yes, I mean to have him. So we're just not reading everything. How long was that, by the way? It was slightly over, but when you read out loud and you have to annotate, it for sure takes a little longer, so... If it was okay. close reading, you can definitely do it in probably half the time, three quarters of the time. But yeah, yeah. Pretty and um, Still pretty quick. It's this is a passage about Japanese culture, about the idea that, um, you know, everything has to be done a certain way. If you're going to ask for a girl for a girl's hand in marriage, you can't just knock on the door in the middle of the night and say, hey, can I marry your daughter? That there's there's a way. And they use the phrase there's the use of a go between. So, you know. 
I know this passage from the past, so I have some insights into it. But as long as you come out of that passage knowing that it's about a guy who broke tradition because he had a special situation and it wasn't well received by the mother, then you have everything you need. And then you can start approaching independent questions one by one. And wherever we are in the passage, we're going to get to know it better and better and better every time. So in a second, I guess we'll wrap up. But what's funny is, you know, on Aspire Test Prep, we've posted tons of content over the years, um, but we'll kind of get really busy with it and then sort of lay off a little. So we got one comment so far in our budding uh, attempts to, you know, get more attention on social media and, and YouTube and so on. Um, and it was about reading. It was, you know, how does this whole reading fasting work? How, you know, how can I make sense of it? And I responded to the student. I thank you so much for your comment forgetting the name right now. Um, but I responded, we're going to go ahead and get into the mechanics of how to use verbs to make sense of things. And so definitely stay tuned. Uh, on Monday, we'll continue this and we'll get deeper into it. Uh, so what are your thoughts, Patrick? Very good. No, I think that, uh, yeah, keep the comments coming, questions as it keeps on growing. Um, the go between between us and our students watching, um, that'll continue. And yeah, we aren't going to have um, any breaks we're going to keep on pumping up the content as I said before and uh, we're turning over a, a new page together working together coming together the meeting of two minds and uh, yeah so stay tuned reading writing and language math we'll be doing it all and uh, it'll keep on growing so if you find it helpful to keep on tuning in as we said five days a week Monday to Friday noon eastern time um, if you're in Belgium like I am it's at 6 p.m. I don't think there will be many people but if there are but of course, yeah, we, uh, we just want to provide as much help as we can um, as we've been doing. So any comments or questions, feel free to reach out. Cool. And Patrick, dude, you're in Belgium, man. Like, go, you got work to do. Just go sit at one of those trendy little sidewalk cafes and just be. Yeah. Here. They're not usually drinking coffee, though. They're oh, stuff. that's the problem. <laughs> yes. And then there goes your hockey performance if yeah. you take part in that. There goes the productivity. So <laughs> stick to Alrighty. coffee, kids. Take yes, the coffee yes. if you have to. There you have it. All right. So thanks so much, Patrick. And thank you if you're if you're listening and watching. And uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, stay tuned. We'll see you guys soon.